live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. October 10th, 2003. We're at the Metrodome for this critical, nationally televised, top 20 matchup in the Big Ten between Minnesota and Michigan. And for Michigan fans, they know exactly what happens during this game in the fight for the Little Brown Jug. Because even 20 or so years later, this game lives on in school history as one of the greatest comebacks that the Wolverines have ever pulled off. Things were looking hopeless for them as they entered halftime down 14-0 and entered the fourth quarter down 28-7, unable to get anything going offensively while being completely unable to stop Minnesota's rushing attack of two future NFL halfbacks in Marion Barber III and Lawrence Maroney. And then, completely out of nowhere, Michigan, despite being stagnant offensively all day, scored 31 points in the fourth quarter, and won at 38-35 on a game-winning field goal with 51 seconds left. It was the largest comeback in Michigan history at the time, beating the previous mark, which was a 17-point comeback against Virginia in 1995. And it sent shockwaves throughout the conference and the country, as the win gave Minnesota its first loss of the season, and would be the catalyst in Michigan getting to Pasadena to represent the Big Ten in the Rose Bowl. But what you might not realize is that this game was never supposed to happen. And I don't mean the comeback or anything like that. I literally mean the game. Michigan threatened to boycott the game and not play it at all, and was adamant about not having to travel to Minnesota to play it. And the reason for that? Well, you can blame the Minnesota Twins for one of the most bizarre scheduling conflicts and controversies in college football in the 21st century. Because Michigan was dangerously close to forcing the Big Ten's hand and saying, yeah, figure something else out, because we're not traveling to Minnesota. And this is the story behind the bizarre conflict and drama between the Michigan Wolverines football team and the Minnesota Twins baseball team. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand how the Minnesota Twins were doing, and why this mattered in the slightest bit to Ann Arbor and to Michigan's football team. The year is 2003, and the Minnesota Twins seem to be struggling pretty heavily. After making it to the ALCS in 2002, before losing to the Anaheim Angels, expectations were pretty high for the Twins in 2003. However, they were unable to carry that momentum with them. They were below 500 at the All-Star break, sitting at 44 and 49, and riding lower than a shoddy with the apple bottom jeans, as they were on an eight game losing streak. At this point, they were seven and a half games back of the Kansas City Royals for the lead in the AL Central. They had an offense that was in the bottom half of the American League in runs scored, and a pitching staff that was in the bottom half of the American League in runs allowed. And things were looking bleak in their quest to repeat. However, after the All-Star break, a switch flipped. Because following the All-Star break, after an abysmal first half of the season, where they disappointed a lot of people, the Twins became one of the hottest teams in baseball. They went on a five-game winning streak out of the break to get back to 500 and erase some of the mess they made at the start of July. They worked their way back to just four and a half games back by the end of July. They were only one and a half games back by the end of August while being six games above 500. And in September, went on an 11-game winning streak. When all was said and done, the Twins won the AL Central by four games and finished the season with a record of 90-72. and 72. Remember, they were 44-49 and 49 at the All-Star break, which meant that over the second half of the season, they went 46-23. and 23. Over their final 69 games, they had a winning percentage of 67%. They won two out of every three games. And as Meatloaf once said, two out of three ain't bad. Just like that, thanks to an unbelievable run of form, the Twins were going back to the playoffs as the AL Central champions for the second straight season. Now, how is this even the slightest bit relevant to college football? Well, the situation with Minnesota's football team was definitely a unique one, to say the least. In fact, in 2003, the Minnesota Golden Gophers were the only team that had to deal with this problem, because in 2003, Minnesota's football team shared the metronome with the Minnesota Twins, with the Twins having higher priority. Yes, there would be some overlap over the first month of the season between the Twins and the Golden Gophers with the use of the facility, but it wasn't a problem, because the schedules were known well in advance, 
and everything could be easily planned around them. As an example, when the Golden Gophers opened up the season on August 30th against Tulsa, the Twins were on the road playing the Texas Rangers. On September 6th, both the Twins and Golden Gophers used the Metrodome, but they made it work. The Twins played the Rangers at 11 o'clock a.m., and the Golden Gophers played Troy at 7 p.m., which gave them enough time to convert the facility. In other words, during the regular season for the Twins, they found a way to make it work. But if the Twins made the postseason, well, that was a completely different animal. And it made things a bit more complicated that this playoff run came completely out of nowhere. No one expects a team that was below 500 at the halfway point to win two out of every three games the rest of the way and steal the division. But because the Twins were in the postseason, and they had to abide by the schedule that Major League Baseball laid out for them in the playoffs because of the TV contracts, the Twins needed the Metrodome for what would have been Game 3 of the ALCS if they made it, scheduled for Saturday, October 11th. The only problem? The Golden Gophers were using the stadium that day for their game against Michigan. So what was the solution to the problem for the Golden Gophers, since MLB had a higher priority? On paper, it was simple. Move the game up a day. Instead of playing on Saturday, October 11th, just move the game against Michigan to Friday, October 10th. Move it up a day, you get to use the venue, and you get to accommodate the Twins. It seems like the best case scenario considering the limited options you have in terms of wanting to still play this game at the Metrodome. There was just one small problem. Not everyone liked that idea. And the biggest opponent against the idea? You guessed it, the Michigan Wolverines. Because they hated this idea so much that they threatened to outright boycott the game and not play it. The man you're looking at right now is none other than Michigan's head coach at the time, Lloyd Carr. He is one of the greatest coaches in the history of college football, and is a proud member of the College Football Hall of Fame for a reason. By this point, he led Michigan to three Big Ten titles, led them to a bowl game in every season, and led them to a national championship in 1997, their most recent one to date, when they won the Rose Bowl over Washington State. Carr became the head coach of the Wolverines in 1995 when he took over for Gary Muller, and there is one interesting quirk about his schedules that you might not have realized. Excluding bowl games, because you have no control over that, and because that's over winter break, so there aren't any classes, every single game that Michigan had under Carr from 1995 to 2002 was on a Saturday. Not once did they play a game on a weeknight. Carr coached 105 non-bowl games at that point, and all 105 of them took place on Saturdays. No primetime Friday night game or Thursday night game, no non-conference game on a Thursday, no special Sunday or Monday game over Labor Day weekend. Nothing. It was Saturday or bust. And that wasn't by accident. Carr designed the schedule specifically so that Michigan would be playing nothing but Saturday games, as he felt that Saturdays were made for college football and were the most beneficial for the student-athletes. Carr hated the idea of playing weekday games, because it meant that you took the student-athletes out of class, which kind of defeated the whole purpose of the student part. As Carr said, it's an issue of academics, it's an issue of schedule parity, and it's an issue we feel very strongly about. It's not like we're publicly asking for a review of Big Ten officials and where they live and where they spend their vacations. We're simply doing something we feel strongly about in terms of taking guys out of class. Carr said that he would play Minnesota anywhere on the original date of October 11th. Want to move the game to Chicago or Green Bay? Fine with him. Not that another stadium in Minnesota really exists, as it was metronome or bust, but if there was another suitable venue to move it to, works for him. As long as he could have Michigan play that game on a Saturday like they were supposed to, so their academics wouldn't suffer. Sometimes, I question the motive of coaches, and wonder if there is an ulterior motive behind this, but honestly, outside of the obvious factor of if you move the game away from the metronome, it's more likely to be a neutral or even pro-Michigan crowd, and it will be less hostile of an environment, I can't think of anything. It's not like Michigan had a long road trip the week before, and now they would have one less day to prepare. And it's not like Minnesota had a bye week where moving the game up a day won't impact them as much as it would Michigan. This seemed extremely in line with Carr's beliefs, values, and ideals. And when Carr said that if the game got moved, he wasn't going to have his team playing in it, he was dead serious. Carr flat out said, in a statement that had no ambiguity or room for interpretation whatsoever, we're not going to play on a Friday night. That's pretty simple. 
So that raises the question. If you had one team who refused to play in the game if it got moved, and another team that couldn't use the venue on the original day, when the Big Ten has to make their ruling, who wins? And the end result was kind of a mixed bag. The bad news for Michigan was that the Big Ten did not move the game out of Minnesota, and since there were no other suitable venues in Minnesota that could have hosted the game, they moved it to Friday night, one day ahead of the Little Brown Jug's originally scheduled date. Sucks, but they would have to deal with it. The good news, however, is that the conference understood Michigan's problem, and didn't leave them completely hung out to dry. Any Michigan fans who were set to attend the game, but were now unable to because of the date change, would be reimbursed for everything by Minnesota. That didn't just include the tickets. That included airfare, other non-refundable travel costs if applicable, and hotel expenses. And on top of that, Minnesota had to pay Michigan for the inconvenience. To simplify things, Minnesota got to keep the game at the Metrodome by moving the game up, but they had to compensate Michigan appropriately because of that. Seems like a pretty fair compromise. And at the end of the day, money talks. Because when Lloyd Carr heard what the Big Ten did, and how they were going to handle this dilemma caused by the Twins, he softened his stance quite a bit, and backpedaled pretty hard. Remember, this was the guy that said, plain and simple, that he wasn't going to play on a Friday night, since it was unfair to his team, his players, and the academic institution. Now he was singing a completely different tune. Because even though Carr was still not happy about this decision, he said he would accept the decision without a fuss, and his team would play. As Carr said, I said we'd have preferred to play on Saturday, but that is something that cannot happen. We trust Jim Delaney, the commissioner, and his ability to do what is best for the Big Ten. I just have to say before going any further in the story, you didn't say you preferred. Prefer means I'll take one over the other, but if the other happens, I can live with it. You issued a demand. Saying we're not playing on Friday plain and simple is not a preference. That's not what that means. But regardless, there were two somewhat bizarre things because of this move. Number one, the Twins got eliminated by the New York Yankees in the ALDS. So even though the game got moved and was now set in stone for October 10th no matter what, they could have kept it on October 11th, and there wouldn't have been any issues. But number two, in many ways, the rescheduling of this game actually benefited them. In the same way that Boston College's game against Miami back in 1984 being rescheduled to Black Friday helped them out which you can learn more about by clicking a card in the upper right corner. Part of why Hale Flutie is still remembered today is because that was the only game on. If that was a Saturday game, then yeah, it would still be cool, but it would be buried with all the other Saturday games in a saturated market. If Michigan pulled off this historic 21-point comeback on Saturday, October 11th, it would be mixed in with every other college game that took place that day. But because it was on a Friday, where there was practically no other competition of note, it was the number one story, and is still remembered to this day. Michigan may have lost the battle, but they won the war. There are many teams that Michigan hates, from Michigan State to Penn State to Notre Dame to the obvious one, Ohio State. But on that list, at least for Lloyd Carr, is a baseball team a few states over by the name of the Minnesota Twins. Because in the eyes of Lloyd Carr, Saturday night was the night that was all right for fighting, and in 2003, the Twins made him change its tune. Because the greatest comeback in Michigan football history was this close to never even taking place to begin with. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.